Today, after Azerbaijan's brilliant victory in the 44-day war, it's interesting to watch the videos of Armenian propaganda, which presents the same thesis in different forms, claiming that the Azerbaijanis are nothing more than merchants, while the Armenians are warriors. That's why the Azerbaijanis will never win. In general, Armenian nationalists despise the neighboring peoples. Back in the early 20th century, one of the godfathers of the Armenian terror, Shahan Natali, wrote that, quote, the cornerstone of the Armenian political life, both external and internal, is the idea of interpreting all the favorable facts to our own advantage, and all the unfavorable ones to the advantage of Turks. A Turk is fool, while an Armenian is clever. A Turk is illiterate, while an Armenian is educated. A Turk is an anarchist, while an Armenian is a craftsman. A Turk is poor, while an Armenian is rich. A whole century has passed, yet those who consider themselves the intellectual elite of Armenia, from the political scientist Sarkis Tsaturia to General Ter Grigoryans, continue to make the same mistakes. Well, let's tackle the problem piece by piece. There is nothing shameful or reprehensible in trading and farming. Quite the opposite, these are peaceful and noble works, in contrast with, for example, the smuggling of gold and diamonds or the forming of ethnic criminal gangs. There is a lot to tell, by the way. For example, General Drov, the commander of the Armenian Legion of the Wehrmacht, who is glorified as a national hero in Armenia, has used his channels to sell the gold and diamonds stolen by the Nazis from the Dot Jews. How about the jewelry industry in Armenia, once believed to become the economic driver of the country? According to the Armenian media, it's mostly engaged in the laundering of diamonds and other precious stones supplied from the zones of local conflicts in Africa, instead of cutting them honestly. How about the criminals engaged in the international smuggling of gold and diamonds, whose last names end in Yan? Even in the blockbusting Franco-Italian comedy film Le Corneau, The Sucker, the name of the chieftain of smugglers, superbly played by Louis de Funès, is Monsieur Saroyan. The film shows a very cunning way of secret transportation of precious metals by stuffing them in a seemingly average Cadillac, piled high with smuggled goods. The gang cuts the car's bumpers from gold, hid the gems stolen in Beirut inside the battery, and disguised a huge diamond in the signal button of the steering wheel. And this brilliant plan, gentlemen, is signed by me. Sa Flawless plan, isn't it? Yet in Azerbaijan and in the whole civilized world, no one would ever think of calling the Armenians a nation of smugglers. Let's recall another unique incident. The robbery of the State Bank of the Armenian SSR, the largest in the history of the USSR. On August the 5th, 1977, cousins Nikolai and Felix Kalachians ransacked the Yerevan branch of the State Bank, taking away the then astronomical amount of money almost one and a half million Soviet rubles. Here is another, more recent example. In 2013, the US sentenced the leader of an Armenian ethnic gang, criminal lord Armen Gazarian, nicknamed Tzo. Gazarian and his accomplices have managed to set up a whole network of virtual clinics used to siphon out tens of millions of dollars from the Medicare, an American medical insurance system. American prosecutors then stated that the Armenian mafia had left the Italian one behind. This Armenian American group puts the traditional mafia to shame. Two years earlier, in 2011, the California authorities announced the defeat of an ethnic criminal gang called the Armenian Force. They were responsible for a variety of crimes, including murder, kidnapping, robbery, extortion, and drug dealing. Yet we don't call the Armenians ethnic gangsters. Also, we can recall the traditions of political terror in the Armenian society that date back to the 19th century. Perhaps few people know that the Armenian terrorists staged a series of terrorist attacks in the Moscow metro in 1977. The first bomb exploded in a carriage moving between the Ismailovskaya and Peromaiskaya stations. In 1999, five terrorists led by Nayuri Unanyan stormed into the Armenian parliament's assembly hall and shot the chairing members of the institution point blank. Among the victims of the attack were the Prime Minister and Speaker of the Parliament. There's never been such a blatant assault on the Parliament in any other country. In 2016, an armed group of the Sosna Tsrer militants stormed the police station in Yerevan. Confrontation between the group and the law enforcement lasted for almost two weeks. Yet another unprecedented incident, even on a global scale.
You cannot find a definition of Azerbaijani terrorism in any dictionary or collection of documents. Yet the Armenian terrorism is well known to all specialists. But again, we don't label Armenians as a nation of terrorists. Therefore, it's worth thinking about what the Armenian nationalists imply more when they compare the nation of merchants with the nation of warriors. An overestimated ethnic self-esteem, national narcissism or trivial envy. While Armenia was waiting for the golden shower of yet-to-come investments from the Armenian diaspora, Azerbaijan managed to build a strong, successful and stable economy, despite the occupation of 20% of its territory and a humanitarian catastrophe with a million refugees. However, some Armenian experts interpreted these realities in their own way and called the Azerbaijanis a nation of merchants. Certainly, making up epithets is much easier than analyzing the real military, political and diplomatic situation. But in this case, perhaps it would be possible to avoid many victims of the war. When the media reports that the Azerbaijani military budget is more than the entire state budget of Armenia, Armenians in Yerevan dismiss the facts again, claiming that the budget will go to fund the general's duchess. Azerbaijan demonstrates its new weapons at military parades, while the Armenians demonstrate firm optimism, saying that fighting is not about weapons but people. We Armenians are warriors. We are Tigran the Great. While the Azerbaijanis only know how to sell greens in the market, I've always told them, where are you going? That's what I told them. I said, you better stay here and sell your seeds. The Armenians got the first alarm back in April 2016, when the Azerbaijani army crushed them under the Lele Tepe hut. But this didn't have a sobering effect either. In July 2020, Armenia provoked a series of skirmishes near the Tovuz district of Azerbaijan. A new round of Armenian aggression triggered a public resentment in Azerbaijan. Young people took to the streets and expressed their readiness to defend the homeland as soon as they were ordered to do so. There were queues in front of the military enlistment offices. However, Armenia failed to draw proper conclusions again. They didn't think why the Azerbaijani youth took to the streets rushing into the battle, while the Armenian youth, on the contrary, tried to escape it. Yet another large-scale Armenian provocation on September 27 led to a real war. Not a single fact of desertion has been recorded in Azerbaijan during the entire period of war. According to the Armenian media, however, 10,000 Armenian soldiers went a wall because they in no way wanted to defend their homes and Kachkars and demonstrate the fighting spirit of the nation of warriors. Today, the Armenian authorities have to implicitly pardon them as the prisons are full of convicted escapees, a cruel, a sobering account for Armenia, which is also indicative for the international community. 10,000 escapees in Armenia against zero in Azerbaijan. But unlike the Armenian political scientists, we don't claim that the Armenians are a nation of cowards and escapees. We do understand that it's very difficult to demonstrate the greatness of the spirit when one does not realize why they have to die. It's difficult to find for an alien land for the sake of someone's political adventures and historical forgery. Expectations of the Armenians for foreign support have failed either. Political scientists like Sarkis Tsaturian assured that if necessary, every Armenian from anywhere in the world would come to fight for Karabakh. This is a turning point. I call on everybody to come to Armenia. Let's forge our victory together. Meanwhile, the authors of these appeals preferred to watch the battle scene from their cozy apartments in Moscow, Paris and California. There were volunteers from the Armenian diaspora, but their number and quality were far from perfect. It was difficult to demonstrate a fighting spirit when the Armenian army of the last century began to retreat under the blows of the Azerbaijani army of the 21st century. Azerbaijani soldiers and officers would flawlessly use the ultra-modern weapons on the front line, breaking the Armenian defense line as a piece of cake. Azerbaijan implements cunning and bold tactical ideas, including the military pocket in Jabrail and the magnificent counter-offensive in the city of Shusha. When the Azerbaijani soldiers liberated this impregnable fortress practically in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but even the war and the continuous Azerbaijani offensive could not bring down the Armenian propaganda frenzy. Armenian experts still push their previous agenda, threatening Azerbaijan, that if the war lasts another week, the Azerbaijani regime is going to regret that. They voice the astronomical numbers of the allegedly destroyed Azerbaijani equipment, accompanying their statements with the footage of military exercises with soldiers shooting at targets. Yet the critical observers asked, if the Armenian military experts failed to figure out the retreating and advancing sites, 
How can they have a detailed information on the plans of the Azerbaijani comment? How come that the Armenian audience was initially assured that there were no Azerbaijanis in Fuzuli, Hadrud, Jabrail, Zangilan and Shusha, yet Armenia signed a surrender agreement some time later? In the vernacular, there is a simple yet succinct phrase to appropriately describe the situation. Telling a pack of lies. Meanwhile, history and war put everything in order. We sincerely advise the Armenian audience to listen less to the revenge seekers version 2.0, who love telling fables about the unique fighting spirit of the Armenian nation. It's impossible to divide peoples by describing ones as merchants and the others as warriors. Any attempt to make humiliating definitions for an entire nation a priori leads nowhere. It doesn't even sound like a childish taunting, nor does it come close to the state politics. The events in Armenia after the Second Karabakh War proved that this was a terrible weapon with a boomerang effect, which can painfully hit those who decided to use it. Isn't it better to try to accept the reality instead of labeling your closest neighbors, dooming yourself to life surrounded by invented enemies?